Hello everyone. Welcome to our lecture 5 on mechanics and materials 1. Today we want to talk about the analysis of structures. We have two lectures on analysis of structures and this is the lecture 1 on those. And also this is our fifth lecture on introduction to statics. If you remember we have six lectures on introduction to statics so we have one more yet to come. And what we talk about today is uh, partially related to chapter 6 of the Beer Johnson book. So far what we have done is that we have dealt with the equilibrium of rigid bodies. In fact in the first lecture we dealt with the equilibrium of points and particles. In the second lecture we talked about equivalent system of forces and we learned how you can transform the forces and moments on a rigid body basically to a point on that body and then using that information we learned how to impose equilibrium of a rigid body so not a point again here is equilibrium of points here is equilibrium of rigid bodies that's the difference then we also learned how to handle distributed forces on rigid bodies so again on the rigid bodies you don't necessarily need to have a singular force or a force at a single point it could be a distributed load or it could be the weight of the structure and something like that or a dead weight on top of the structure and that was the discussion on our previous lecture lecture four what we want to do today is proceed on that equilibrium of bodies or rigid bodies but now we want to talk about structures consisting of multiple members or multiple rigid bodies so previously we always talked about just one rigid body now we want to think of a structure that is a rigid body altogether but is also made of multiple smaller rigid bodies an example of the, such systems is truss structures and frames. So these are two examples of interesting structures that we deal with in mechanical engineering and then truss structures is something that is commonly used for for bridges and so on and basically a truss structure is composed of the so-called truss members. So the term truss is essentially a straight two force member that is only connected at joints to other members. So if you think about this structure basically shown here, if you think of each piece, each piece looks like a little two force member that has pins at the end. And then these pins or these joints, they do not apply any moment okay so they are they are just applying forces so that's about trusses but how about frames so we want to know what's frames and before i talk about frames i i need to emphasize that usually instead of the word truss structure we may just call it truss so the word truss may be referred to as truss member or truss structure but usually if we just say trust it's usually referred to as a truss structure now in a truss or in a truss structure all members are two force straight members okay so th this is very important now if you think about this member here for instance member eb this is a two force member and if you remember if you have a two force member then the forces on that member must be equal in magnitude and in opposite direction and along the member to keep the equilibrium so it has this very interesting property and usually this specific property makes these structures interesting structures to to analyze and to use now in contrast to that we can also think of frames. The fundamental difference between frames and trusses is exactly what we just discussed. So basically frames contain at least one 
member that is not a two force member so they contain at least one multi force member so if you think about this structure shown here well member eb itself it's a truss member but if you think of the member ad or member cf these are not two force members and basically for that reason what we are looking at here it's not a truss it's a frame because it contains at least one member that is not a two force member okay so let's begin with trusses first and then we later come to to the analysis of frames in the following lectures in this lecture and in the next lecture we talk specifically about truss structures one key factor about truss structures and how you use them is that all the external forces in such structures are applied on joints only this is in a way related to what we just discussed previously if you think that each member is a two force member and it has joints on the ends then they can only carry two forces with equal magnitude and opposite direction so it naturally cannot allow for the third force acting anywhere else on that member so as soon as you have that you are not talking about a truss member or truss structure so this is one key characteristic that you should always remember and you should always have in mind for instance if you think of the structure that we are showing here these two forces P and Q are applied on joints B and joint D. So having said that, now for each joint, you have two equilibrium equations, balance of forces in the X direction, balance of forces in the Y direction, and then again, these equilibrium equations both together, this is just the balance of forces. And in 2D, this usually means in 2D, this usually means balance of forces in x direction and y direction. But in 3D, you may also think of the third balance equation in the z direction. An important remark here is that there are no additional balance equations for the moments. Okay, so you should or you could usually think of the balance of moments but these are truss members and we are writing these balance equations for each joint so each joint is just a point and if you remember we said when we talk about points because they don't have any dimension the balance of moments it doesn't give us basically additional information that's a uh, that's a priori satisfied if you want okay so if you think about this structure then you have a few joints so let's say here we have one two three four five joints at each joint you have two equilibrium equations so you have two equations per joint these are equations these are the equations you have now what are the unknowns the unknowns you can see these are here the reactions the support reactions at a and e so these are three unknowns so one two three so basically you have three unknowns three reactions from support that you don't know but also you don't know what are the forces in each truss member So here you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven truss members that are also unknown. So if you put all these together, you can see that these two patches, basically, the truss forces and reactions from support, these are the unknowns, 
and then your equilibrium equations are what you get from the joints and as you know we want the, these to be equal in order to be able to solve the system of equations and basically that for you means that two times the number of joints must be equal the number of truss members n plus 3. And as you can see for this example, exactly we had three reactions plus seven members. This was two times five. We have five joints. Okay, so this works and then we have equal number of equations and unknowns and that means we can solve this system and and this this is a key characteristic that holds for usual truss structures and we use this throughout the examples to solve them or to be able to solve them now different truss structures are shown in figure 65 of the book different truss structures have different properties and they are used for different purposes. An interesting one that you may be familiar with, for instance, is, is the one that you can see for a stadium or the usual ones that you see for bridges and so on. So there are different types of structures and there are for truss structures and they have different properties, but this is, this is not something that we want to particularly analyze, but this is something that you should know. And then you, you should know that in theory, you would be able to optimize these structures and you can design them based on the applications that you have in mind. Now, in order to analyze truss structures, you have two methods to, to do that. The first method is method of joints, and we do that in this lecture. The second method is method of section and method of sections, and we do that in the next lectures. Okay, so in the next lecture, we talk about method of sections and then also this method of sections is something that that is also useful when you analyze frames okay so we talk about that again in the next lecture but also in the lectures after that okay so how do we know which method to use if you are asked to calculate all the forces in all members, then you should use method of joints. Okay, so basically that, that is the, the way to go if you, if you need to calculate all the forces. However, if you are asked to calculate only very few forces or very few members status, then you can use method of sections. But also, as I mentioned earlier, if you are dealing with frames, usually method of joints is not going to help you, you would, because you would have more unknowns in that, and then you need to cut the structure and split the structure into multiple parts to be able to solve that. We will, we will learn all of these with examples. Before we start to analyze a truss structure, we need to pay attention to an important note, and that is something that is very important from, from now on in this lecture. It was not important until now, but from this point on, it's a fundamental concept and it appears almost in every problem, not only in truss structures and not only in extensions, but also in different problems that we are dealing with later, such as bending, torsion, and shear forces. So from now on, we need to distinguish between internal forces and external forces. So until now, we usually had a system. And then on that system, you have a few external forces and you satisfy equilibrium equations on those external forces. Or maybe you had a body like a, again, a beam, and then you can think it's on a roller on the left and on a hinge on the right, for instance, and then you can just say sum of forces is zero and sum of moments is zero. You can solve that, but 
the forces that you are dealing with here and you are talking about here and the moments, these are external forces. These are the forces that are either externally prescribed by you or these are the reactions from the support. But in any case, these are external. These are not inside the structure. These are not internal forces. This concept is important, but more important than the concept itself is a confusion that usually students have when they are dealing with this concept because in terms of the signs of the force, it has a different way of dealing with signs than we have usually in our external forces. So for instance, think about this system. It's a very, very simple two-force two member, member AB, in equilibrium. In order to keep this thing in equilibrium, you need to apply a force on the right and equal in magnitude in the opposite direction on the left. Now, if I ask you to calculate these forces and then we set a usual coordinate system, we always draw the unknowns in the same direction as the coordinate system. If we do that, that means you would end up for force at A, at, for, for the force in the x direction at B, you would end up with 5 Newton plus 5. For the force in the x direction at A, you would end up with minus 5. But now this minus is just telling you the direction of the force itself. So this, this is clear. This is just about the external forces and the external forces usually are dealing with an external coordinate system. But now let's think about the member AB. If you think about the member AB itself, you can also think that this member is carrying a force or there is a force inside this member, and we call that FAB. And by the way, FAB is equal to FBA, so we don't distinguish between the order of the endpoints. Whether you call it member AB or member BA, it's the same member, so it carries the same force. Now, what can we say about, about this force? Th this is the question, basically. And then again, the difference between this force and what we just had previously is that these forces at the end of the member, these are external forces. The force that we are talking about is an internal force, is inside the member. And as I mentioned earlier, the external forces, they have this property that they follow external coordinates but the internal forces they do not have a coordinate they are just the forces in this structure now we need to define a convention here okay so it's just our convention it's not something that you have to follow but this is something that i will use for this lecture and for the rest of the lectures in this series. If you use this convention, it's fine. If you don't, you should always make it very clear what you mean by the force in a member. So our convention is this. If you have a member in tension, we assume the force in the member is positive. It has a plus sign. If the member is under compression, we assume the force in the member is minus, is negative. Okay? So for that matter, in this example, in this example, we would say the force in the member is 5 because the member is under tension. Again, remember having a positive force in the member or tension, it means that you would need two forces in the opposite direction. So again, on the right-hand side, it means a plus. On the left-hand side, it, it means a minus, according to our previous 
convention for external forces. But you should not confuse them. Either you are talking about external forces, in which case you always follow a coordinate system, or you are dealing with internal forces, in which case you should always use a convention or definition. For us, this is what we have. This is our convention. If you have a member under tension, you assume that the force, the internal force is positive. If you have a member under compression, you assume the internal force is negative. These two pictures are shown here, but also you can always think that tension is like pulling. So if you are pull, pulling a structure, or if the result of your force is usually the elongation of the structure, that means you are talking about a positive force. If you are pushing the two ends of the structure or the two ends of the member together, that means you are talking about a negative force or about compression. So it, it causes shortening of the member. Again, this is just a definition or a convention for us throughout the examples that we will see. But usually, you should always make it very clear if, if uh, you are asked to do so. So you can always just talk about numbers. You can say, well, you can say the internal force is 100 and it is tension. Or you can say the internal force is 100 and it is compression. And for us, this means it's equivalent to a minus 100, and this one is equivalent to a plus 100. Okay? Again, either you use this convention or you clearly write what is tension and what is compression to avoid confusion. All right, equipped with that, now we can come to method of joints and analyze a few structures or a few trust members together. Method of joints is fairly simple. It basically has three steps that are very familiar for you individually, but then you should go through them in this order and then you can solve the problems. The first step is just to draw the free body diagram and calculate the support reactions. And usually, again, for a two-dimensional problem, you would have three unknowns or three reactions from the supports. Once you have them, then you split the structure, and that means splitting into joints, so split by joints. So you go through the structure joint by joint, and for each joint, you impose equilibrium at that joint. And then again, equilibrium at, at any joint, that means the sum of the forces on that joint must be zero. And again, for 2D, that means the sum of the forces in the X direction is zero and sum of the forces in the Y direction is zero. Here is a simple example of such a truss member or truss structure. The first thing you want to do is to look into this picture and then you can see well from the support at a you have the reaction r a that is unknown and then from the support at b you have the reaction r b and you can imagine the support at b is usually something like a roller that's why it does not have a force or a reaction in the x direction the support at e at a is a hinge so it has both components so anyway you would have here let's say a y AX, and then here you have BY. So you have three unknowns, and then in the first step by free body diagram, you calculate. Once you have that, then you split the structure into joints, and that you would have joint A, joint C, joint B, and joint D, and for each of these joints, you satisfy equilibrium separately. For instance, if you think about joint A, You can see it here. So you know the force is RA, and assuming that RA is, for instance, vertical, 
you can imagine that the, the forces in the two members AC and AD must be such that they can both together equilibrate RA. Okay, so they must be the sum of those two forces must be basically equal to to RA or the negative RA RA to keep equilibrium. Now, why the force in the x direction or AX is not appearing here? The reason for that is that if you if you had written sigma fx equals zero, you would immediately see that the force in the x direction at a is zero. So we know that the supports reactions at a is also only vertical. An interesting and very useful example is a point like D or a joint like D. At a joint like D, when members have this orthogonal situation, so if the members are perpendicular to each other, you have this very nice property because you know that, that for instance, if the force P is just downwards, you know that DB cannot have a force in the vertical direction. DA cannot have a force in the vertical direction. So all the force in DC must be equal to the P. And the same holds for the other two members, so that's what you can see here. So basically, P is pulling this joint downwards, and then the, the force in DC must pull it upward exactly with equal magnitude. So th this is kind of to give you a rough idea of how we do this if you wanted to look at it, let's say, graphically speaking. But you, you don't have to do this graphical illustration or graphical imagination. For you, for each joint, what you have to do is to set some of the forces in x is 0, some of the forces in y is 0. That's all you have to do. So basically, you always have two equations, two unknowns, and you naturally get what I just said. So again, this thing is just some sigma fx0. This thing is just sigma fy is 0. And again, the fundamental assumption here is that the members, each truss member is a two-force body. And having a two-force body, it means that they can only carry forces along the member itself. We will learn that just now by going through an exercise together. So we want to learn how to deal with truss structures and how to calculate the response of such structures by an exercise today. We have only one exercise in this lecture. This exercise is similar to problem 6.1 on page 295 of the Beer Johnson book. You are asked to determine the force in each member of the truss. Pay attention that it specifically asks you to calculate the force in each member. And remember, when we need the forces in each member, then we should use the method of joints. More importantly, it asks you to clearly indicate if a member is under tension or compression. And this is the discussion that we had about the differences between internal and external forces. So basically, because we are dealing with internal forces, it wants to make sure that you, you know how the internal forces are acting on the structure. So we said when we have a structure like that, or we, if we have a truss structure, we usually have three unknowns from the support reactions. In this case, you can see the support at E is a roller. That means it cannot have any resistance against motion in the x direction. So it does not apply a force in the x direction or in the horizontal direction. Therefore, we only have EY, and that's one unknown. The support at C, it has two components, CX and CY, and these are also unknown. So we have three unknowns. This is our free body diagram. You have two 
forces of 10 and 5 kN applied on A and B. In order to solve this, you basically go through your governing equations or equilibrium equations of statics in 2D and you remember these equations are usually the balance of forces in the x direction, the y direction and the balance of moments. For each of them, again remember, we need to clearly indicate a direction, a positive direction. Usually we would assume that this is the positive direction for x, so towards right. Positive direction for y is upwards and then positive direction for m is a counterclockwise rotation. So if you write the sum of forces in the x direction, there is only one force that gives you Cx equals 0. In the y direction, you have Ey upwards, Cy upwards, and then 5 kN and 10 kN downwards. So you get plus, plus, minus, minus. So again, the forces downwards, they come with minus. Now you need to write the balance of force and the balance of moments with respect to a point. You can write it with respect to any point. It is better to write it with respect to a point at which you have some other unknowns so that the unknowns on that point itself, they don't enter the calculations. For instance, you can see that here, Cy is not known and Cx is not known. I mean, now we know it, but it's essentially an unknown to the problem. So if you write the moments with respect to C, then the forces or the reaction Cx and Cy, they don't enter this equation. So usually you are dealing with a lighter equation to handle. So that's why we write the balance with respect to C, but you can also write it about any other point. Now, if you think about that, the distance from 5 kN to C is CB, and that is 6 meter. And this force is going to rotate, or to essentially to cause a counterclockwise moment. So basically you get plus 6 times 5, so distance times force with a plus sign. If you think about the 10 kN force, the distance is Ca, and 10 kN is downwards, so it also will cause a counterclockwise rotation, and that's our positive direction. So you get plus 12 times 10, again 12 is the distance, 10 is the force itself. The force at Ey, it has a distance of 3 meter, okay, but you can see that it wants to turn this or it wants to cause a clockwise rotation. So you have a minus sign, minus 3 times Ey. Again, dealing with this plus minus sign in this example is because we are just doing it in a 2D. If you, if you think of it as a usual three-dimensional problem, and for instance, you, you write this in terms of vectors. So for instance, you say, this is the vector CB and this is the force V. Then the moment would be just CB cross F. You don't have to think if it is counterclockwise or clockwise. It's naturally embedded here. So it's always like that, but only because we are dealing with 2D, we also need to use our intuition for simplicity. So if you do this, again, you have three equations, three unknowns, Cx is trivial, it's zero. And then these two equations are basically two equations, two unknowns, and they give you their reactions at C. And then again, pay attention that the reaction at C in the y direction is minus. That essentially tells you that this direction that we chose was wrong, so this would be 35 kilonewton downwards. Which kind of makes sense when you think about it or when you look at it. So you would have now 35 kilonewton downwards. 
plus 5, plus 10. So these are all downwards and they should be equal to 50 kilonewton that is upward from E. Okay, so the three unknowns, the external forces, we have calculated them from free body diagram so far. Now we need to split the structure joint by joint and solve it for each member. So how do we do that? We start from a joint with two unknowns. Then you compute these two unknowns and then you proceed with any other joints progressively as long as that joint has also two unknowns. So remember for each joint you get two equations. So for each joint you have only two equations sigma fx0 sigma fy0 and that means you need to work with joints with two unknowns at each time and then you can solve those unknowns let's say in pairs of two and two and two and then eventually you can solve the whole structure so in this case if you look at a at a you have two members a b and a d we don't know what is the force here we don't know what's the force here and if you think about joint a it has two unknowns so we start with that. So for joint A, you have two forces FAD and FAB that you don't know. Remember for our convention, we assumed we draw the forces such that the member is in tension or tension would be our positive convention. So if you want to think about the member AB, if you think that the member AB is under tension, that means that the force from joint A to member AB is such that it causes a tension. So if you think about the member AB to be under tension, that means the joint A itself from that member is also pulled. Okay, so this these are action reaction forces. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that the force direction from a joint must be pointing away from the joint to show the tension. Hence being positive or plus sign. So we always do that. We always draw the forces such that they go away from the joints. So if this is joint A, this is a tension force or it's an inner internal force that will cause tension and this is an internal force that will cause tension. Okay, so once you have this, now you just deal with this as a usual free body diagram for which you can write the governing equations or the equilibrium equations in this case, you have two equilibrium equations. You have the sum of the forces in the x direction to be zero and the sum of the forces in the y direction to be zero. And for that matter, you just deal with this system as a usual system. You don't have to think that these are internal forces or external forces. So for instance, when you want to write the sum of the forces in the x direction to be zero, you again need to assume what is the plus direction and for the y direction, the same thing. You assume that towards right in the x direction is plus and upwards in the y direction is plus as we did before. So if you do that, you can see that FAB is in the positive direction, the x direction, so you get plus FAB. FAD times sinus alpha, so this would be FAD times sinus alpha, that would be also in the same direction as FAB, so that's positive. So the sum of the two must be zero. In the y direction, you have 10 kilonewton downward, so minus 10, and you have FAD cosinus of alpha. That's also downwards with a minus sign. And for the alpha, you know that 
the sinus and cosinus alpha are 3 over 5 and 4, 4 over 5 from the dimension dimensions uh, given here. So you know that the distance AD is 3 and the distance here is or the height is 4. So this is this famous triangle of 3, 4, 5 and this would be your angle alpha. So this is essentially two equations, two unknowns, and based on that, you can calculate FAB and FAD. And if you look at them now, FAB will end up being positive with a plus sign. FAD is with a minus sign. And you may just say, well, this is a tension and this is a compression. Okay, so if, if you clearly say it's a compression, you, you may or may not write this as a minus, okay? So basically the minus sign is our indication that it is a compression. And that minus sign, as always, it means that this direction wasn't correct. So this would have been basically 12.5 in the opposite direction like this. Okay, so we have now these two. If you think about this part of the truss, it is kind of magnified here and we cut it in between. So you can see that for A, we just solved what was at A and we come to D, to the joint D. At joint D, you have now FAD, which we already know what it is. Then you have FDB and FDE which you don't know what they are. And then again, FAD, we draw it just as we spoke always. So we assume that FAD is the in the tension direction. Remember, this, this was what we had from joint A. So previously, we just learned this. We learned that this must be in the, in the opposite direction, but you don't have to enforce it. You can just say, well, I keep drawing it like this, but I keep a minus sign next to it. I think this, this will be easier to handle the problem so you don't have to always think about the direction. You can just always draw them away from the joint and then with a minus or plus sign indicating the direction, indicating the nature, whether it's compression or tension. Okay, so we do exactly the same thing for joint D. At joint D, you have three forces. We draw all of them in the direction away from the joint and the two angles here again from the dimensions these are also alpha this triangle is the same as the well the left and right triangles are identical so basically once you have this now again we treat this like a free body diagram and we write the equilibrium equations in the x direction you have de towards right you have AD, well, the horizontal component of that, which is FAD times sinus alpha, but in the negative direction, so it comes with a minus. And then you have FDB sinus alpha with a positive direction or in the same direction as DE, so it comes with a plus sign. So this would be your balance of forces in the X direction. In the Y direction, you have these two forces, FDB and FAD, cosinus alpha, both of them in the upwards direction. So essentially this is two equations, two unknowns, because you already know what FAD is. So I'm just writing it as FAD, but we already know what that is. So the unknowns are only FDB and FDE. So you have two unknowns, two equations, you can calculate them. And if you do that, then you would end up with this. So you would say FDB is 12 and a half kilonewton. So you may say it's 12 and a half tension, specifically FDE, it turns out to be minus 15 kilonewton. That means 15 kilonewton compression. Okay. So once you write clearly if it is tension or compression, then the sign is not that important. It identifies the sign because these are internal forces. So now after joint A and joint D, we come to joint B. 
So if you look at what we are doing from this picture, maybe it would be very clear to you. We started from joint A, we solved this. Again, remember we started with a joint with two unknowns. So we had two members attached to joint A, so it was a good joint to start with. So we calculated that. Then initially joint D, it had three unknowns because it was connected to three members. But then once we calculated this one, then we could also calculate these two. Now joint B, it is connected to four members. That means it has four unknowns, but now we know already two of them. That means we can also come to joint B and calculate the forces in the two truss members attached to B. So joint B here is magnified essentially. And you can see at joint B, if you draw the forces, and then again, remember, we draw the forces away from the joint or pointing away from the joint to be positive or to show the positive direction. So if you do that, then this would be FAB, FBD, FBC, and FBE. At this point, it should be very simple for you how to handle this. This is essentially playing the same game and turning the same crank, essentially. You, you write the balance of forces in the x direction and balance of forces in the y direction. Again, if you look at this now, the force in the BC is in the horizontal direction and pointing towards right. That means it comes with a plus sign. The force in the BE, it has a horizontal components also pointing towards right. So that also comes, and then again, this would be essentially the cosine of that angle, maybe I call that theta, and you can calculate it again by the dimensions in the problem. Now, FAB is pointing towards left, so it comes with a minus, and FBD is again, this, this angle is theta, so FBD cosine of that angle would be the horizontal component and it comes with a minus sign. So that's the balance of forces in the x direction. In the y direction, FBC and FAB, they don't enter the balance of forces in the y direction because they do not have a vertical component. But FBD and FBE, they both have vertical components and that would be essentially FBD cosinus of this angle plus FBE cosinus of this angle. So these are these two components and they are both pointing downwards. So they both come with a minus. And then you also have this force of five kilonewton pointing downwards. So all of them enter with a minus sign because we assume that the upwards is the positive direction. Eventually you are dealing with the system with a system of two unknowns, two equations. You can solve them. You end up with FBE minus 18.75 kilonewton, which means it's 18.75 kilonewton compression. And FBC would be 26.25 kilonewton. That means it's 26.25 kilonewton tension. So that's that. Now, if you look at our truss structure, we have started from here and we calculated these members one by one. There is only one member left and we want to do it now. For that remaining one member, you can start from joint C or you can start from joint E. It really doesn't matter if we do start from joint E. You have a 50 kilonewton upwards. And remember, this was essentially the EY that we calculated as the support reaction at the beginning. You know what is FTE and FEB from the previous part. There is only one FCE left. And for that, you can, for instance, set the balance of forces in the X direction. So you know that the horizontal component of that, so if you imagine it's theta, then this would be FCE cosinus theta. And that would be with the plus direction and cosinus of theta is 0.6. So that's where it comes. And then you have FDE with a minus sign. And then you have FEB times, again, cosinus of theta also with a minus sign. 
you add them up, they must give you zero, and we know already what is FEB and what is FDE. Pay attention that as we spoke previously, we draw the forces away from the joint, so pointing away from the joint to be positive, but then when you insert them, you insert what you just calculated before, so you co they come with the minus sign. You should always think, think of it as if a computer is solving this problem. So you shouldn't bring your own judgment to it once you start the calculations. Okay, so it's just one equation, one unknown. For that matter, you can calculate an FCE. It's 43.75 kilonewton with a minus sign, which also means 43.75 kilonewton compression. It was not necessary. It was not necessarily to look into the balance of forces in the y direction. But if you did, you would also end up with, with the same result exactly. So we have now all the forces in all the members. That's that's it, and we just solved the problem. But let's let's pay attention to the equation that we had from the beginning. So in this example, you have five joints. For each joint, you had two equations, so you have 10 equations. You have seven members, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you had three unknowns from the supports. So three unknowns plus seven unknowns here, that would be all the 10 unknowns. And then you had 10 equations from the joints, Basically, that's why we could solve this truss structure. So that's the method of joints. In the next lecture, we will talk about the method of sections. So in this lecture, we wanted to cover parts of the chapter 6 of the Beer Johnson book. That was our first lecture on analysis of structures and also the fifth lecture of introduction to statics we have six lectures on introduction to statics so there is only one one more to come and in the next lecture we talk about method of sections to solve truss structures but also to solve frames and to deal with frames <laughs>